Good day, everyone. Welcome to Titusville First United Methodist Church. I never remember to say, please sign the red pew pads. Uh, while, we, while we're getting started this morning, it's nice to have those signed. Uh, I don't believe we have any announcements today. Uh, is there anything? Tuesday evening, finance meeting, and council meeting. So I guess those, that covers the announcements for today. We want to welcome everybody that's here this morning, as well as those who uh, join us on television and internet. Uh, we welcome you as well. Uh, we have a lot of exciting things going on this week, and uh, uh, many of our members are down south after the wedding at, uh, for Jimmy and Danielle uh, yesterday. That was a beautiful occasion, and uh, many of us shared in that with them. And some of them didn't make it back, and some of us did. Even Joe made it back, and he was a... He was a busy father of the groom yesterday uh, with all the catering and all the celebrating. And so we, we're glad to have Joe and Maria back with us this morning. If there are no further announcements, will you please stand and join me for the call to worship? Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call on God's name. Make known God's peace among the people. Sing praises to God. Tell of all of God's wonderful works. Glory to God's holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Let us remember the wonderful works of God. And the hymn this morning is, I Love to Tell the Story.
Remain standing past the peace and the love of Christ. Please come, children. The puppets are ready for you.
Our Father in heaven, we are thankful for this uh, exciting reminder of those Ten Commandments that you gave to your people so long ago. Help us to be reminded in such a way that we work to keep those commandments in our lives and, and, and practice them in all the things we do. In Jesus' name, amen. Now we can take up the collection. And somebody needs to go to the balcony. Do you want to do that? Okay, you do that. No. As the children complete their collection, the ushers will come forward to wait on us for our morning offering while we have special morning music today. I come to the garden alone While the dew is still on the roses And the voice I hear falling on my ear The Son of God discloses and with me and he talks with me and he tells me i am his own and the joy we share as we tarry there none other has ever known 
speaks and, and the sound of his voice is so sweet the birds hush their singing and the melody that he gave to me within my heart is ringing and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own and the joy we share as we tarry there none other has ever known. I'd stay in the garden with him, though the night around me be falling. But he bids me go through the voice of woe, his voice in me is calling and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own and the joy we Lord, we bring these gifts. We lay them before you at your feet. You are the one who gives every good gift. You are the one who provides every resource that we have. You are the one who's given us talents. You are the one who's given us music. You are the one who's given us skills. All these things we lay at your feet, asking you to use them for your kingdom. In Christ's name, amen. You may be seated. God calls us when we come together to bow our heads and unite our hearts and lift up our prayers of thanksgiving and praise. Let us now pray. Our Father in heaven, we do come to you on this summer day in a very exciting time in, the, in our community around us, the celebrations that are going on, the, the recognitions of, of things that have happened in the past and looking forward to things in the future. We come together thinking about uh, uh, the joining together of Jimmy and Danielle yesterday and the excitement of, of that day and, and the promise uh, of their future together. So we ask your blessing on them. At the same time that we celebrate, Father, we know there are many that are suffering from different, different uh, kinds of illnesses and and different problems, so we want to lift those up to you, Father, knowing that you are aware of every one of them, and, and your love and your touch and your spirit has already been a part of healing and comforting, and so we give those things over to you. 
We ask, Father, that you would use us. Use us to be an extension of your hand by the way we reach out to those needs. Help us and guide us and direct us toward the needs of, of anyone who needs them, that uh, we would be an inspiration and a witness to the love of Jesus Christ by the way we reach out to others. Be with us, Father, in all that we do. Help us to celebrate throughout this, this summer season the wonders that, that you set before us, the wonders in nature, uh, the, the wonders in love and, and relationships. Be with us now, Father, as we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please stand. For him, 171, there is something about that name. So we get ready to hear the scripture this morning. Uh, I have I've asked Isaac if he would come and read the scripture. He has finished a summer of working at Wesley Woods. And will you say it's nice to have him back in town here, okay? Thank you, Isaac. Good morning, church. We're reading from Matthew chapter 14. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side. While he was, while he dismissed the crowd, after he dismissed the, uh, oh, after he dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone, and the boat was already considerable, a considerable distance from land but fade by the waves because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came towards Jesus. But when he saw the wind and was afraid and began and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. 
Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you. Thank you. As you can see, Tuesday was the 90th birthday for Glenn Rogers. And uh, Glenn, just a shout out to you, uh, wherever you're at, by the way, happy birthday this week. May there be many more to all of our friends at Westbury and those of you who are gathered with us from all over the place. Um, we're just thinking about all of you and we miss you when you cannot be here and glad when you tune in and watch us as well through the television. I have uh, just had so many things that, that were going on this weekend in our congregation and lots of things that were happening and we've enjoyed all of them. Uh, in the early service, we had a chance to hear a little bit about uh, uh, Mike Strawbridge and got to hear that he got to share his story of his song. Have, how many of you have ever heard the song, the one song that, that Mike ever wrote? Have you ever, ever heard it? Uh, evidently, he was able to sing that last night at the, uh, um, at the reunion at the high school or at the school and, and, uh, and be able to share a little bit about what Christ had done with him. Pretty exciting. We uh, had an absolutely delightful time. Uh, those who were able to be with the Johnnies at the wedding uh, yesterday, and, and Joe Maria says she's tired, but I expect that you're doing just fine. And uh, no problem, right? I get it. And uh, so that's pretty exciting going on. Um, and these kind of things, in my mind, uh, remind us of how many good things happen outside the walls of this building. Those of you who, who uh, get together many times, many of you come out and, and enjoy the concerts on the Monday nights. Many of you here, I get to see many of you there. And, uh, and it's the opportunity for us to be able to hang out a little bit with some of the other people and uh, with, with um, people from other churches. <laughs> people from, uh, with no church uh, and uh, people who are believers and people who are downright skeptic. But it's just a great opportunity to get together, which brings me to the, the part of my message that I want to talk about in, in, in what I call Blue Ocean Strategy. Now, this is not my term. Blue Ocean Strategy comes to us from a couple writers. And I saw this article a little over a decade ago. And, uh, and I scrambled to look for it here this week because I, I thought it fit what I was trying to, trying to deal with here. Uh, Blue Ocean Strategy is a strategy that, that comes out of the business world where whenever you are involved in extreme competition and you're, you're battling over, over getting a market share uh, in order to make your business go, and many of you don't understand this concept very well, that it sometimes becomes like a feeding, feeding frenzy uh, in shark-infested waters. Because uh, in the competition, if you can picture uh, Geico and, and uh, State Farm and, and General, and think of all the television ads you see, they're all battling after what's probably a limited market in, in insurances uh, and, and car insurance. So when you battle over that, the way you define success is whether or not you're getting an increasing share of that market or a de decreasing share of that market. But when it comes to matters of faith, uh, what we find out is, or, well, this comes from the business world, so that if you want to get out of that extreme competition, sometimes in your business you can find a niche or a place to market whatever it is you do or have to sell uh, into a place in which is kind of a new era, area or a new territory and the competition's not so great, the, um, the economists call that a blue ocean strategy. Go to where there's not so much competition and add value to wherever you're going. Well, I, I like what that says to me in this process and have been enjoying thinking through that uh, during this last week. For instance, uh, downtown right now, I love to call like the, the, the streets, streets of Titusville, right? Downtown Titusville. Uh, if you get downtown to the east end right now, you'll find the new business, the, the well, right? Uh, the well has, has taken a, a place that was, uh, and, and repurposed it. Uh, you tell me, what did that used to be right there on the end of that? Say it again. There you go, a service station. Gas, right? It was always used to serve, but to serve a different thing. Uh, but in this day and age, you know, with the way the pumps and the tanks and everything has worked out, that's not a good location anymore for that. So that has not been used that way. So it's empty. Now, all of a sudden, it's being repurposed and used in such a way. And, and you see the signs on the front. By the way, I, 
I don't know the I've heard about the people who do this, and, and, it's, a, and it's a beautiful concept. And they have the gathering place written there, and they've got uh, seating outside and inside, just baiting you and be giving you and me the opportunity to go sit down there and have a conversation with someone, maybe a cup of coffee or a soft drink of some kind and be able to hang out with one another. And as I at least understand it from what gets passed on to me word of mouth, it's just a beautiful thing offering a chance for relationships, people to come together. I call that blue ocean strategy. Not taking meals away from the existing restaurant, but providing a place to be hang out. For a lot of the existing restaurants, if, if all of us hang out there the whole time and do nothing but drink coffee, uh, we take up a lot of table space whenever they need to turn over meals. You get the idea? Blue Ocean strategy is getting away from where the competition is and, and just allowing what you have to offer uh, in, in just wide open territory. It's a beautiful concept. Salespeople would understand uh, this very message. So how does that, reply, or how does that apply once again to, uh, to Jesus? And of course, that's what we're going to take a look at today. Uh, we're, going to, we're going to look at, at how, how competitive sometimes churches have become, where, where nothing makes us happier than when someone from another church comes to our church. Uh, boy, that's, that's not where we're going, is it? Or, or what makes us sad if someone from our church goes to another church? And sometimes we've been involved in what I call a, like a red ocean, where it's a feeding frenzy. To, to, get the, to get the most popular ones or to get the ones with the... And quite frankly, sometimes when we go from, when we go from place to place, it's, uh, some of the congregations are maybe saying, oh, good. <laughs> Who knows, you know? Uh, the, the red ocean concept is just that. It, it gets to be shark-infested water sometimes. But whenever the church steps outside their building and begins to get a hold of, of uh, new areas in which maybe no other church is ministering to, or a type of ministry that is a little bit different. That's blue ocean strategy. Uh, Jack, I believe whenever you, and, and whenever, whenever you open up your home, and I guess Jerry is allowed to be part of this, you know, whenever you folks open up your home, not competing with anyone else, but minister to the ones that God has given you to minister, that's blue ocean strategy. Wide open, where you're not competing with anyone, but allowing for something good to happen and meet a niche that takes place. When, um, when Mike Strawbridge uh, takes, uh, takes his Bible and goes up to co-oil Johnny's on Saturday morning, that's Blue Ocean strategy. How many people are competing for, for men's time at 7 a.m. on Saturday mornings? You, you understand what I'm saying? We're not getting in anybody else's way, but taking Jesus with you as you step out. Uh, coming up later on, in, in a, just in a couple of weeks, Alberta Smith, who worships with us at uh, at, in the 8.30 service and, and also is connected with the Baptists across the street. Uh, they have been going to the park lately uh, and the park over by the towers in the last year or so and they started to do fundraisers and they've quit doing the fundraisers and they're just serving people over there. I think they've got hot dogs and some food and things like that but it isn't about food. What they're doing is just hanging out with people, uh, visiting with them. Uh, hang, and and uh, so Alberta has extended an invitation to you and me, any of us who want to, on Sunday nights from 5 to 7, not this week, by the way, but I think it's the last week in, in, in uh, August, but to be over there for a couple hours, uh, not to, to bring food, she says, but to be able to visit with people who are coming through the park and, uh, and build relationships with the opportunity eventually to offer Jesus whenever the time is right. Those are blue ocean strategies, and I've always liked them, and I am blessed by them whenever I see it. Uh, there's no competition in some of those blue oceans, and the things are all new, and eventually, whenever everyone is doing the same thing, then a new blue ocean's place needs to be thought of. So what does that have to do uh, with Jesus here in the first place and walking on the water? All I'm saying is that when Jesus uh, walked out onto the water and then allowed Peter to step out of the boat and walk toward him, uh, this was something very, very new. He was allowing Peter and the disciples to risk things that they never dreamed that they would be able to handle. And then God blessed them in that very process. So I like it. I, uh, I look into this idea of, of how we go into uncharted waters and, and what it does. For Jesus, he came against the, the ruling class. I, I think I'm saying that the wrong way. He, 
kind of bumped up against the ruling class. He bumped up against the religious leaders. Uh, and, you know, so many of us want, want to hobnob with, uh, with bigwigs, don't we? We just like that. We, we like to think that important people know who we are. Uh, one way or the other. I, I just, you know, here's an interesting point. Uh, I, I just saw one of, the, one of the, the, the ladies from our congregation here this week uh, in a local establishment. Uh, and, uh, and so I, I went to say hello. And, and she, was, uh, uh, she was taken back because she didn't think that I knew who she was. And I said, I pray for you all the time. Uh, but but you, you gather that there's sometimes this impression that, that the pastor loves some people and not other people. And, uh, and quite frankly, nothing could be further from the truth of that. And so you and I need to always remember it's so easy to give attention to those that are over us, but so unbelievably difficult sometimes for us to be able to realize that, that uh, um, those who are not in the limelight or in the attention getting attention all the time need what you and I have to offer for them at the same time, all right? So this brings me to what Jesus did. He, he didn't hang out with the Pharisees constantly. He didn't hang out with the religious rulers, but we see that he did have dinner sometimes, uh, and it was sometimes the, the well-to-do people who had him for dinner, but he, instead of giving just attention to them, gave attention to, um, to the working man or to the tax collector or to, uh, to, to, a, to a woman who had a bad reputation or you fill in the blank. Uh, that is Jesus going where nobody else was going at that time. His ministry was more personal and it was more caring. He emphasizes outsiders. Even the disciples he picked were different. You do understand if these disciples were, were recognizable godly men, uh, and those with great potential, another rabbi would have already asked them to follow him. You understand that? But Jesus goes and sees what other people do not see. I don't know that you and I would have picked Peter and James and John. I don't know we would have picked up Thaddeus. I don't know that we would have picked Philip that, that Jesus picked. He tends to go outside the status quo and he goes to places in which people are not being competed for uh, and with and, and he draws them into the kingdom and into his service. If you get what I'm saying, nod your head because I feel like I've taken to Nod your head. I can move on. <laughs> Thank you. If you'd have known I was going to say that, you'd have started nodding five minutes ago, wouldn't you? Yeah. Sometimes the only nodding going on is sleeping nodding here and I want to, want to make sure I'm in the right ballpark here. It brings me to what Jesus would do, red ocean as opposed to blue ocean. You know, in Jesus' day, here's a red ocean concept, by the way. He says, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy, all right? Jesus says, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Oh, Jesus doesn't say that. That's what people said in that day. I hope you caught that mistake, all right? Uh, that's really what those were doing in those days. They... They, uh, it was easy to, to uh, love the ones that they knew, and, uh, but then to really hate the enemy. And one of the things, I just, I am just always stunned by that. Uh, he goes for the tax collectors. Uh, the, they, they hated the Romans. Jesus would be involved with healing, should it come up. They disliked the irreligious. How do you feel about people, not just who don't know Jesus, do you not feel better about people who come to church even though you suspect they may never have had a, a life-changing experience with Christ? Do you sometimes feel better about them than you do those who are outside the church? Whereas the ones that are inside the church never had a life-changing experience might be in a more dangerous situation than the one outside in the general population who have never pretended to have faith lives. Jesus was able to understand this concept. And what's, what's Jesus say? He says, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. He did that, did that very well. Another place we look into Beatitudes, and Red Ocean statement would be, uh, would be for them in that day age to bless those who are strong. Um, again, I mentioned the religious leaders. Um, even the Romans, uh, who did the religious leaders work with when they wanted to get rid of Jesus? They worked with the Romans. They hated him with a passion. They wanted very much to get rid of it. Yet they worked with the Romans in order to get accomplished what they wanted to get accomplished. Jesus uh, doesn't say blessed are the strong, but the blue ocean part of him was they said blessed are the meek. 
thief on the cross, the compassion that he had for the crowds, the healing of the sick, the ministering to those who were not noticed by anybody else. Red Ocean strategy, blessed are the satisfied. Um, they were into earning their righteousness, by the way, and if they kept the law, they felt good about themselves. But Jesus says in a blue ocean strategy, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Even the disciples said to Jesus, teach us to pray. Help us to learn how to do that. And so Jesus eats with the tax collectors, the sinners, the lawbreakers, the ones who did not keep the ceremonial laws and, and, and do what they needed to do to be appropriate whenever they'd come into the temple to worship. Jesus had his disciples pluck the grain of, 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 uh, from the, uh, for, for wheat or whatever it was that they were eat, trying to eat whenever they were so hungry, whenever they were being criticized for, for picking on the Sabbath. Jesus was understanding that in a different way. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And he would feed them when the time comes. Well, I want you to picture the scene here. So Jesus says, uh, take Take heart as I and do not be afraid. Just want you to, to, to picture this if you can and if you will. Um, Jesus has no patience for anyone who would rather stay in what's traditional than in order to step out into uncharted waters where the Holy Spirit is worthy to guide and to instruct and to bless. I mean, you and I don't have to go very far to see the parallels between standard church structure sometimes and some of the problems that they had in first century Christianity or in first century Judaism. Um, you can see some of those problems and they're real. And Jesus seemed to have absolutely no patience whatsoever for those who'd rather stay trapped in tradition rather than tap the power of Almighty God and what God was getting ready to do. Um, so he, Jesus meets him on the water. Remember how this went? Uh, they had just got done feeding the 5,000, and uh, Jesus uh, has heard about John the Baptist, and he, and he still needs to go away to be by himself to deal with that. He sends the disciples across the Sea of Galilee, and uh, I have not seen the Sea of Galilee. Some of you have. Uh, fortunately, Gary looked that up for me, and... and uh, you know, and I think we're talking about eight miles by 11 miles uh, at some of the places on the Sea of Galilee. Pretty big lake. Um, more so than, than, than what you feel like rowing. And rowing against the wind, sometimes this feels absolutely impossible. If any of you ever done that? I, I said once I was out on the, on the, on the lake up, up in, uh, not, well, I said, uh, I said Chautauqua, but it's Finley Lake. Not even Finley. It's just even smaller than Chautauqua. I was out in the middle of that one, which is about, about a half a mile across. And, and I had gone out from the conference campus up there, and, and I got out in the middle of that thing. I said, I have time to turn around, because I'm a tough guy in a canoe. I turned around only to face the wind. The wind's not supposed to come from that direction. But I turned in to face the wind, and all I could do was just keep, keep slugging until I could go. I even started tacking a little bit in order to, order to get so I didn't have the wind completely in my face. It's time to get back. Can you imagine the disciples on that lake, on the Sea of Galilee, struggling that night, getting nowhere? Then in the waves and in the tempest, to look out and see Jesus coming across the water. Uh, such like paranormal that, that people like to put in movies this day and age, you know? That's what it would have seemed like to them. Uh, you know, the belief in that day was that all kinds of evil things ab abide, w w were staying in the depths of the sea. So it was really a dark time for them, and here comes Jesus, and they were afraid. And Jesus says, take heart, it's I, do not be afraid. And um, some of the scholars tell me that, 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 that the Greek version of it is I is very similar to the Hebrew part of I am. Uh, and, and so really, Jesus is once again identifying himself from the God, the creator, God of Moses, the God of David, the God of everyone. And uh, he says, it's I, do not be afraid. Peter. Finally, someone with a little bit of gumption, someone with a bit of faith, says, Lord, uh, you know, basically, let me, let me come walk out to meet you. Jesus says, come on. By the way, 
be careful when you ask to meet with Jesus, by the way, okay? He says, come on. So Peter gets out of the boat, and he steps out, and he moves a little bit towards Jesus, and all of a sudden the wind comes up, splashing comes up, and he begins to be afraid, and you know the story very well. He begins to sink, does he not? And uh, Jesus reaches out and takes him by the hand, and he says, oh, you have little faith. How many of you can identify with Peter on this one? Where, where we've gotten out, we've tried something that we never thought God would ever ask anybody to do. And we feel pretty good, feel pretty bold. In fact, even like making the announcement of what ministry we're getting ready to do, start and get out there. And all of a sudden, we feel like we're starting to sink. I want to teach you a prayer. It's really about three words long. It goes like this. Help me, Jesus. Want to practice this with me? Try it with me. Try this prayer. Help me, Jesus. We're flipping about that many times. That's a real prayer. And uh, Jesus picks them up and they get into the boat. You know, and, and lots of times in the, lots of times, several times in the scripture, we find out that when the disciples would see what Jesus would do, they said, who, who is he that even the wind and the waves obey him? Well, here's my question for you. Do you understand what it's like to step out and do something that you never thought of necessarily? and yet God stretched you in such a way, and the blessings have come. I have, uh, on a couple occasions, uh, heard Lee Baker. In fact, I, I said, that, you know, one says, what Jesus said. Now, let's see what Lee Baker says, by the way. Lee, Lee didn't like sound that. He thought that sounded a little rough, but, but I said, you'll get what I'm asking, Lee. And uh, one of the things, that, the stories that Lee tells is uh, what it was like whenever he's worked in our camping program, because... Uh, Lee, many times, you know, he has background in, I, I call him the Renaissance man. He's done everything, had every job that's ever been known to the, to the mankind, okay? And, uh, but he's always been brave enough to take whatever step God has for him. And Lee, would you come share that story about the canoeing camp and the bicycling camp that, that I love to hear? First thing you need to understand is the only time I walk on water is when the creek freezes over. But there were times when I had to say, Jesus, help me. Uh, Herb West asked me to uh, use some of my uh, talents, I guess, or, or interest of bicycling and canoeing to, to do a camp program. So I was asked to do the paddle and pedal camp. So we were to paddle from Titty you to Franklin in the canoes, and then we were to change to bicycles and ride the bicycle trails for a couple days. So it was paddle and pedal. And uh, it went quite well. My son and my future daughter-in-law agreed to counsel with me and uh, you know, be counselors in the camp. And, and so they were very helpful. Uh, <laughs> We had a young lady in the camp that was kind of a special needs person. They told me about some of her special needs, and so I thought, well, she would be a good person to be in the canoe with my daughter-in-law, future daughter-in-law, and that's where I put her. And that worked well for the first day, but the second day, my do my Robin said, I can't take another day of that. <laughs> she has to go in your canoe. So sure enough, Kathleen joined me in my canoe, and throughout the day, she laid in the bottom of the canoe and slept. And uh, she wasn't a great help with it, paddling, but she held the front of the canoe down, so that was a good thing. Well, we got down to Oil City, and we always stopped when we do that, we'd stop at McDonald's for lunch. We went into McDonald's, and I had all the kids scurrying around there, I think there were about 12 or 14 on the, on the trip. And so, some lady, an older lady in her 60s, I think, she came up to me and she says, are you the leader of this group? And I said, yeah. And she says, you can't take those kids through that rapid under the bridge. And I says, well, I have to. That's the only way to get down the river. Well, it seems that the week before there was a, young man swimming down in that area that drowned, and she thought it was too dangerous. She says, you can't take those kids through that rapid. And I said, well, I'm sorry, but that's the only way to get down the river. Well, we got that organized very well. My son Jason went ahead with his kayak, and 
He was down there in case anybody got in trouble. And I lined the, the canoes all up and sent them through one at a time. And I went through last. And, oh, we got through in good shape. Well, on down the river we went. And, and I kind of got ahead. I was a pretty fast paddler, even without Kathleen's help. And I got ahead. And, and then just a little ways down the river, Jason came back, or caught up with me with a kayak. And he said, Dad, you have to go back. The kids can't get down the river. The wind was so strong coming up that area, down past where Kmart is, the wind was so strong that the, the kids weren't strong enough to paddle against the wind, like Pastor Larry said about being on, on Findlay Lake. So I went back. I went back to find disaster. I had canoes everywhere <laughs> against the banks, against, you know, going backwards up the stream. And it was a disaster. And that's when I needed help. I had two young ladies in one canoe that got in an argument about who was paddling and not paddling. One got angry and threw her paddle in the river, and the other was mad, and she jumped in the river to get it. And so here I had one girl in the river with a paddle and, and one girl in the canoe with no paddles, and they were arguing. Oh, it was a disaster. And so finally I started pulling things together. I got three people in each canoe with three paddles, and then they were strong enough by staying over close to the shore, they were strong enough to fight the wind, and they were able to go downstream. The problem was I had two empty canoes. I had to tie those on the back of my canoe and, and paddle not just with one, one canoe, but three of them tied behind, two of them tied behind me. But we made it down the river to Franklin. That was not exactly a blue ocean scene, but perhaps a blue river scene. And we made it, you know, because God gave me, I guess, the wisdom and so on to pull that thing together well enough to be able to get all 14 of my young people and all the canoes down the river to begin our bike ride. Is that sufficient, Larry? Excellent. <laughs> you like that story? Whether you believe it or not, we say thank you to him for that. Okay. <laughs> I've heard that story now uh, three or four times, and, and uh, I, I never, get, never get tired of it. And, and, uh, and how many feel like it's always Kathleen with you in the boat? You know, it's, that's the way it works. But I like, I like the fact that that no matter where Lee has been in life, he has been made himself available to God whenever there is a new opportunity, whether that be ramp ministry, uh, whether that be going from administration and, and education into, into ministry. It doesn't, doesn't matter what your walk of life is. Wherever God is stretching you, I believe he's constantly calling you out of the competition circles into the place where there is a niche where, where no one is meeting what's going on. And I think the Holy Spirit works in that way all the time and we'll be inviting you. I like this uh, little image. It's on your bulletin. All the goldfish are in one, one, uh, one place, one, you know, one jar, one, one bowl. And, uh, and finally one gets up enough gumption to jump out of it and head towards the new one. And uh, where there isn't any competition, an opportunity to start life anew. I have a suspicion that God is wanting to do new things in your life and in the life of, of me and in the life of our congregation. I, I don't know what that is. Uh, I know that the Holy Spirit many times reveals things, sometimes to the body, sometimes to the leaders. But, uh, but I just want you to continue to be in prayer as God directs us. Remember, Jesus never gets excited whenever you and I are, uh, only find comfort in doing things, in, in being the way, uh, in worshiping the way or, or, or acting the way we always have. Uh, and many times as we... As we care for these beautiful traditions that we always have, uh, we sometimes miss what God is getting ready to reveal us. So it's not a matter of throwing everything out. It's a matter of being open to what God has new for you and for me. I leave you with this last statement. When we step into blue oceans of faith, we will be a church that walks on water. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Stand.
and turn your hymnals or onto the screen to 467, Trust and Obey, verses 1 and 4. How many of you know Josiah is going through some red ocean right now? Trying, <laughs> you know, if I were just preaching here, Josiah, I could have gone for another 15 minutes. There's lots of air right here, and that's what gets your flame. Hey, Josiah, thank you for serving Jesus. May you do it all your life. And with you, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. 